<coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. We do have a shorter text this morning, but it is a little bit fuller. Let's go ahead and get to it. Um, chapter 13 of Acts. This is the beginning of the first missionary journey and uh, you know, going to Cyprus, remember, and Paphos, where they meet Sergius Paulus, and uh, perhaps more importantly for our consideration this morning, Elymas, uh, the magician, the sorcerer, uh, who basically gets a curse on him for attempting to try to fight against the progress of the gospel. And again, here's the spiritual warfare that we're talking about. By the way, I should mention this, the spiritual warfare is going on every time they engage anyone, whether that person's a magician or not, okay, a Pharisee or not, a Roman or whatever. There's always spiritual warfare. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against, again, the spiritual forces of wickedness, darkness, and so forth. It just becomes more overt when the person happens to be a sorcerer. All right, well, let's, uh, let's read the text. Acts 13, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Now, there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, um, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, for so his name is translated, um, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Let me just add one more verse. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Uh, that last little point shows us that there was a, a bit of a casualty here in this spiritual <coughs> warfare. <coughs> well, may the Lord open up his word to us this morning and bless this message. Now, two weeks ago, we saw the Lord do a couple of things to prepare to send his gospel to the world. First, he changed the hearts of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem to accept the fact that he was bringing the Gentiles into his kingdom without their first having to become Jews. Now, that's a very important point. Remember, a point that's going to be revisited in Acts 15. It's so important to get the gospel right if you're going to do evangelism. We have to trust in Jesus alone. That is all that we need. Jesus to be justified, His righteousness his death on the cross. We must not add any works to this. Now, we understand at the same time that doesn't mean that works are not important. Okay? Works are the evidence that we are trusting Jesus alone. The fact that our lives are being transformed into his image by the Holy Spirit 
Again, as we're reminded year by year, the reformers said, we are saved by grace through faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. It is always accompanied by works. And by the way, what, is, what are works? Works are obedience. Obedience to the word of God. If we are trusting in Jesus, if the spirit of God has made us new creatures, we will obey what the word of God says, not perfectly, but substantially, consistently, that will be our practice and we'll do it because we want to do it. Now, last week we saw two further parts of his plan fall into place. Uh, the first was the, uh, the death of Herod. Okay, remember Herod found that when he killed James, that, that made the Jews happy and he liked the fact that that made the Jews happy because it made it easier on him. So he thought he would also arrest Peter but the Lord moved him out of the way permanently by executing him. Remember, he was eaten by worms because he didn't give glory to God for the speech that he had given and the praise that he received uh, from the people. So that was one thing. And then secondly, with that persecution now coming, having come to an end, Saul and Barnabas were able to return to Antioch and with them John Mark. So the stage is now set and the mission begins. So this morning we see, we really want to see two things, the calling and ordination of Saul and Barnabas, and then the spiritual opposition they face in Cyprus. <clears throat> now, first of all, we see the calling and ordination of Paul and Barnabas. Okay, Luke gives us a list of the laborers who had gathered in Antioch and tells us a little bit about their offices. They were uh, prophets and teachers. And this is the list in verse 1. Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, we're familiar with Barnabas and Saul, who begin and end this list, but who are these other people? Well, this Simeon, interestingly enough, is quite possibly Simon, who is from Cyrene, the man that the soldiers forced to carry our Lord's cross when he was carrying it out, remember, for his crucifixion. Uh, that man was from Cyrene. Remember how the, it was those from uh, Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch in order to preach the gospel. And that's how this church at Antioch was established. Now, think about the connections here. Here's a couple of people from Cyrene who are teachers, and the first place they're going to go is Cyprus. I think the influence of these who brought the gospel is, is at work here. Now, Lucius is also from Cyrene and is likely among those who came from Cyrene to preach the gospel at Antioch. And this man, Menaean, notice that the fact that he was numbered with them shows us that the gospel is already beginning to reach the higher class because who is this man? Well, what Luke tells us what is that he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, we realize there's a lot of Herods in Scripture. This particular one is Herod Antipas, not the one who was eaten by worms, okay? But Herod Antipas, the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Now, I want you to notice that they were both brought up the same way, but one of them is a believer, and the other one is a wicked man who went to his place. What makes the difference between these two? Well, it's only the Lord's mercy, isn't it? that distinguishes between one or the other. Remember how uh, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and before they were born, the Lord says, Jacob, I love Esau, I hate it. It really boils down to God who makes the difference. Now, while these men were ministering to the Lord, and the word minister here, notice, is from a Greek word that where we get our English word liturgy, which means that they were praying and they were singing as they were praying and singing and seeking the Lord and they were fasting, and notice this is ministering to him. It's something that God delights in and uh, something he blesses. While they were doing these things, while they were seeking the Lord, the Spirit spoke and he revealed his will to them, which is an, you know, unquestionably what it was they were seeking. In verse 2, the Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, sometimes we ask the question, how can I know God's will for my life, right? Uh, 
Well, the way we know it is by reading the Bible and applying what we have here. But sometimes there are questions that need to be answered that aren't necessarily answered here as far as the moral standard of how I am to do what I am to do. I need more information outside of that. How do I get it? Well, we, we get it by ministering to the Lord, by worshiping Him, by seeking Him in prayer, by singing His praises, by sometimes fasting. Now, the Lord may not necessarily speak to us directly as He spoke to them in those days, but He will speak to us through His Word if the question is an ethical, moral question. And He will speak to us through His providence if we're looking to Him for guidance because the Lord is the one who opens and closes doors according to His will. So they sought the Lord's direction and the Lord gave them direction. He called apart Barnabas and Saul to the work uh, that He had for them. Now Barnabas and Saul had shown themselves to this point to be faithful in what the Lord had entrusted them to do. Remember, they were the ones who came to Antioch. They were the ones who discipled the disciples. They also went to Jerusalem to take the gift from the Antioch church because of the famine to the saints who were there, showing the love of the Gentiles to the Jews. Now, having been faithful in these responsibilities, He was giving to them a greater responsibility. Now, Jesus tells us in Luke 16.10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. In other words, what we do with the small things reveals what we're going to do with the larger things. So if we want more opportunities, more responsibilities to serve the Lord, we simply need to be faithful in what He has already given us to do because the small things are also important. Okay, they show our character and they also show us whether the Lord is going to give us more to do. Now, one last thing I want us to note on this first point about the calling of, of, of basically Barnabas and Saul is who it is who actually called them to this work. Okay, it's the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I think you're aware that there are those who deny that the Spirit of God is actually a person. Okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses see Him as an impersonal force. They see Him as God's divine power that He basically sends out to accomplish things, but not as a person. But we do need to ask this question, or these questions. Can an impersonal force make decisions? Can it issue commands? Does it have authority? Well, no, these things can only be true of a person. Can an impersonal force be grieved that we choose one course of action over another, that we do things that are sinful in, in His sight? No, those things can only be true of a person, and that's what the Holy Spirit is. He is a divine person, the third person, we say, of the triune God, who, as reminded in the Confessions, with the Father and the Son, is to be worshipped and obeyed, okay? The Holy Spirit has all the divine authority of God. He issues commands, and of course, when He commands, we follow. By the way, <clears throat> how does that work with us today? Since He's not speaking audibly, again, He commands us through His Word. But there's also this other aspect which is somewhat subjective, where we are to yield to the Spirit and not to the flesh. Well, the flesh has certain desires and it wants us to go one way and the Spirit has other desires and He wants us to go the right way, Paul tells us we need to yield to those desires of the Spirit. Now, again, what He's going to give us the desire for is what He tells us in His Word. So how do you distinguish between the two? Well, what the Spirit is giving us the desire for is going to be consistent with the Word of God. Anything outside of that? It is not the Spirit of God. Okay, so having received the Spirit's orders, they fasted, they prayed, they ordained Barnabas and Saul to the work of missions. And again, this reminds us that when it's clear that the Lord is calling a particular man to the work of the ministry, the recognition of that call and the conferring of the power and the authority to do that work is symbolized by the laying on of hands by the elders of the church. 
And, you know, I think, I think it was Robert Mary McShane who said that um, after he was ordained to the ministry, he expected that when he preached that he would experience more of the Spirit's power in his ministry than he had ever experienced before. You know, it's interesting that in the Old Testament that when they ordained somebody to the office of either prophet, priest, or king, they always did it by pouring oil on their head. You know, I, I'm thankful that they used laying out of hands in the New Testament personally, but they used this as a symbol of the Spirit's anointing. Well, in the New Testament, it's the laying out of hands conferring, as it were, this, again, empowering of the Holy Spirit to empower the person to do what it is they're being called and set apart to do. So that's the significance of this laying on of hands. Now, secondly, we see the spiritual opposition that they face in Cyprus. Luke writes in verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Seleucia is the seaport closest on the west coast, as it were, to Antioch. From there they boarded a ship and sailed to Cyprus, which is an island off the coast of Syria. And interestingly, it's, it's so named Cyprus because of a plant that grows there called the Cyprus plant, which is um, in, in Greek. Uh, but we call it today henna. You know, henna is a plant from which you get a, I think it's a reddish dye. And that's what they used it for in those days. So when you think of Cyprus, think of Kypris, which is the henna plant, and that's where it gets its name. So they first land at Salamis, which is a port city on the east coast, and they're going to work their way across. This city was formerly the capital city of Cyprus during the time of Alexander the Great. But it was, a still, it was still an important city, even after the capital had moved to Paphos. Starting from there, they began to proclaim God's word in the synagogues. Remember, Israel is, is still basically, you know, God's still working with them. He's still bringing the gospel first to them. This is that 40-year period before he destroys the temple and puts an end to the old covenant system, which, you know, effectively has already been put to an end because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But it's still, the promise was to Israel, so they go to the Jews first, and then when the Jews basically either, you know, respond one way or the other, they're going to turn to the Gentiles, which is what they do. And we read here that John Mark also accompanied them. And we know that, you know, Luke doesn't give us the results, but the results are likely what happens in each case. Some receive him and some don't, depending again upon God's grace and his mercy. I think the important thing to see here is, is that the gospel was being preached. <clears throat> God's people were being gathered into His kingdom, right? In order for there to be a harvest, in order for people to be saved, the seed of the gospel needs to be planted. That's why they're doing the work of missions. If we want to see any kind of a harvest as far as in the people that we're working with, we need to sow the seed of the gospel, which doesn't mean, you know, that we throw tracks at them or somehow literally, you know, throw some seed, but we need to tell them the truth. We need to speak to them about the gospel and explain it to them. And then that seed needs to be watered by repeated contact with them and sharing more, perhaps helping them to understand more, and by praying for them. And it's really through this process that the Lord brings people to Himself. But not just prayer alone. It, it, we have to come in contact with them. We have to interact with them. There has to be this seed which is sown. If we could just pray for people and they'd be saved, we'd end up pretty much like the hyper-Calvinists, you know, who believed you didn't have to go do the work of missions. You didn't have to travel to Africa to see Africans saved. All you had to do was pray. And then God was going to save them somehow because He's sovereign. But Paul reminds us in, in Romans 10 that if we do not go out, no one is going to be saved. They have to hear Christ speaking. And He speaks through His Word. And, of course, only somebody who has His Word can, can speak it. So, again, the importance of planting seed. But now getting to the main point. As the kingdom of God advances, we should also expect the kingdom of the evil one to fight back against us. When they came to the capital city of Paphos, they were summoned by Sergius Paulus, He's the proconsul, the Roman official who's in charge of that province, uh, and he would be, of course, at the capital city, which is what Paphos is. He was aware of what 
Saul and Barnabas had been doing within his jurisdiction, and he wanted to hear what they had to say for himself. Now, from what happens next, we know that it was God's will that this man be saved. I mean, the Lord is sending Saul and Barnabas from Palestine and Antioch and all the way to Cyprus so he can redeem this particular individual. But we also see from what happens here that he's not going to be redeemed before Satan does everything he can to try to stop him. So when they arrived, they found that the proconsul actually had company, a magician. Okay? The word means astrologer. The word can mean dream interpreter. The, mean, uh, the word can also mean sorcerer. Luke tells us that he was a Jewish false prophet by the name of Bar-Jesus. Okay? The word bar means son of, and Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the uh, Hebrew word Joshua. And by the way, he wasn't claiming to be a son of Jesus, the Messiah, but Joshua was a very common name. He was also called Elymas, which is the Arabic translation of his name. Now, Luke tells us the proconsul was actually a very intelligent man, but somehow he was under the false impression that this man, this Elymas, uh, was a wiser man than he was, and he had him there for the purpose of counsel. This reminds us that no matter how intelligent we might be, no matter how smart we might be, we can still be deceived by the enemy, right? The enemy is much wiser than we are. The enemy is much more intelligent. The enemy knows our weakness. He knows how to pull the wool over our eyes. Now, when Elymas saw them, he began to oppose them. He began to argue against them. I think from a human perspective, he was trying to save his job. If the proconsul embraces the gospel, he would no longer have any need for him. But from a spiritual perspective... The devil was using this man and his ambitions to try to keep the proconsul from coming to Christ. Now, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 12 during his ministry that he came to bind the strong man and to plunder his house. I believe that's what the Revelation 20 image of the angel coming down from heaven, binding Satan and putting him in the bottomless pit, I believe it has to do with the same thing. Satan is bound. He is not bound absolutely as though he can't do anything, but he is bound that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years are completed. And by the way, I think if, if this means anything to you, all mills and post mill believe that Satan is currently bound, whereas dispensational pre mills believe that's still future from our perspective. But again, the idea that he is bound doesn't mean he can't do anything. But, and that means essentially, that doesn't mean he's going to stand idly by while, while his house is being plundered. It just simply means that he can't stop it from being plundered. He will do everything in his power still to hold on to every soul that is in his kingdom. And that is why we see the things that we see going on today. That's why there's so many false religions that are out there trying to lead people astray. That's why... Our, somebody like R.C. Sproul needs to deal with philosophy and science who deny the existence of God and who try to promote false religion, false philosophies of evolution. He's going to tell us this evening that the prevailing view of how the universe came into existence both in philosophy and in science is through self-creation. It created itself from nothing. And that really should be the easiest view, actually, to refute because it's completely irrational. But where does that irrationality come from? Rather than a sufficient cause to explain the universe and everything that's in it, okay, which would be an intelligent God who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and all-powerful, they decide it was nothing that just suddenly burst all this into existence, just, you know, the hopeful creation theory, I guess you would call it in this case. Well, that comes from the devil. And that's also why whenever we share the gospel with someone, inevitably the enemy is going to come against us. The devil, his demons, the world, the flesh are all working against us in the same way that Elymas was working against Saul and Barnabas. And by the way, we need to recognize as well that they're not just in other people working, they're also working in us. 
These are the three enemies that we as believers will always have to struggle against. Whenever we step in the direction of obedience, whenever we begin to seek after the Lord, whenever we begin to pray or worship or sing, this is what's going to try to keep us out of this. Or any duty the Lord calls us to, particularly the duty of evangelism, Satan does not want to lose his captives, and he is going to fight against us. We need to count on it. We need to be ready for it. Now, A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar, believes that, that this debate between Elymas and, and Saul and Barnabas could have been a public debate, uh, and that wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing, actually. Our brother, Jeff Cox, uh, some of you remember him from years ago. He's now with the Lord. He used to do street evangelism. And when they were doing street evangelism, they had some of the people who were basically a part of their organization standing there to form part of a crowd so that other people might join. But the one thing that really uh, sort of brought the Lord's blessing down on that evangelism or that evangelistic event is if somebody got into an argument with Jeff over the gospel because that had a way of bringing a much larger crowd. It was much more animated, and of course, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot more energy and certainly a lot of the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in those kinds of events. Now, in this case, this may have been a public debate, and it had some impact on the proconsul, but it wasn't just the debate. It's what happened next. Luke writes in verse 9, but Paul, or Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. Let me remind you that Saul is, is, is the, basically Paul's Hebrew name, and Paul, or Paulus, is his Roman name. And now that his work is centering mainly on the Roman Empire, this is the way that Luke is going to refer to him through the rest of the book of Acts. It's not that conversion changed his name, okay? His name was always Paul. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with courage, filled with strength. By the way, the, the condition that we are called to be in at all times, right? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Fixed his eyes on Elymas and said, verse 10, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Uh, by the way, who do you think would maybe took their cue from, from Paul right here in church history? You know, there's something that is called the ethic of civility. You know, that, that even though you may be my enemy, I'm still going to be nice to you. Well, during Luther's day, that ethic of civility had not yet been developed. And so we find... <laughs> that Luther doing and saying things that we would never imagine people saying today because he said, there is nothing too foul that could be said about the enemy of God and the enemy of our souls. And Luther said it. He said it not only in words, but also uh, artists taking these conceptions, made some very interesting wood carvings and, and uh, wood carving prints that... Um, I think you would find rather illuminating, okay? Well, I think we see here that this ethic of civility didn't exist in Paul's day either. He is calling a spade a spade. And I think there are times when it's appropriate for us to do the same, when that person is, is overtly, you know, an enemy of God and blaspheming God. Now, one of the indictments that Paul makes against the people of this world in another place is that they not only practice what God hates, they also give strong approval to those who do exactly the same things because it makes them feel better about their own wickedness when there are other people who are doing the same thing. And that's why we see the wicked always promoting the particular form of wickedness that they practice. And that's what we see Elymas doing here. But then we see this. Paul, by the power and the authority of God's Spirit, pronounces judgment on him. That is, the Lord's judgment. And he didn't do this on his own. He did this again by a motion of the Spirit. Verse 11. 
Now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. You notice how the judgment is, is appropriate to the crime. The uh, Elemist, the magician, is trying to blind the proconsul to the truth of Christ, to the light that, saw, that Paul and Barnabas are shining. And so the Lord takes the light out of his eyes, at least temporarily. Some suggest that perhaps giving him time to reflect on what he was doing and on what Paul and Barnabas had been preaching in order that he might be saved. <clears throat> but notice that this judgment also had a positive effect. The Lord used it to bring about new life in, in the life of the proconsul. We read in verse 12, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now again, remember, it wasn't the miracle that he saw that changed his heart. The miracle simply proved that the message that Paul and Barnabas brought was from God. It was the Spirit that made the message powerful to give new life to the proconsul. It, you know, the fact that we can't do miracles today is not going to change that is not going to change the fact that God can still bring life from the dead. But notice this. When Satan tries to stop the kingdom of heaven from moving forward, God overrules what he does actually to advance the kingdom. And again, that's another reason why Jeff Cox liked the opposition. You know, we don't like opposition, do we? We want people just to say, oh, I believe everything you're saying Show me how I can receive Christ. We don't want to get into the argument with them, but Jeff enjoyed the argumentation. He enjoyed the opposition because of the fruit that it inevitably brought. That's what happened on this occasion. So the point here is don't let the opposition discourage you from sharing the gospel with others. The opposition is inevitable, but the Lord may very likely turn that opposition into the advancement of the gospel in the lives of the ones you're seeking to minister to. Now, the last thing I want us to see is this, that all of this appears to have proved to be too much for John Mark. Maybe all the hard labor, maybe the confrontations. Uh, we're not really sure, but we read in verse 13 this. Now, Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, <clears throat> but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Uh, he returned not to Antioch, which is where he went out from, but he returned to Jerusalem because this is where he was from. This is where his family was, perhaps because he was ashamed of, of his failure. Uh, we will see not too long from now that when Barnabas on the second missionary journey wants, you know, wants to take John Mark with him, Paul is going to adamantly oppose him in this regard because he abandoned them during the first missionary journey, okay? Faithfulness is important. We need to follow through with what the Lord calls us to do, okay? That's one thing we see here. But the second thing we want to see is this, that God is merciful, okay? The fact that Mark failed, John Mark failed, did not mean he was no longer useful, Scripture shows us that he later repented and the Lord used him again. As a matter of fact, Paul singles him out and he says, bring Mark with you because he is useful to me. And let's not forget, this is the same Mark who wrote the gospel by the same name. And that is certainly no small honor. Now, the warfare that we're in can sometimes overcome us, perhaps many times. We're fighting against forces that are much stronger than we are. Again, let me just refer you to Pilgrim's Progress. Apollyon was certainly much more formidable than Christian, but he had God's armor. Okay, we need to remember that even though Satan is more powerful, even though his kingdom is more powerful than we are as individuals, we have one who is for us, who is much greater than the one who is against us. And that brings us back to the point of putting on the full armor of God, doesn't it? We need to be equipped 
in all these different areas that I mentioned before. We need to learn to trust the Lord for His strength in this battle. And by the way, how do we get this armor? We don't go to an armory and put it on, as again Christian did in Palace Beautiful. It would be nice if we could just do that. But it requires a great deal of work, and that work is called worship, okay? It's essentially the same thing that Paul, Barnabas, and these other men were doing. It's in ministering to the Lord that He actually ministers to us, okay, that He equips us when we read, when we're taught, when we're worshiping, when we're praying, when we're singing. These are the things that build us up. And let me just mention, serving is a big one. Whenever we serve the Lord, I think we grow much more, and I think even more particularly when we try to evangelize, even if we, humanly speaking, fail to bring that person to, to Christ. And remember, as R.C. is going to remind us again, it's not up to us ultimately to persuade that person. It's up to us to give them the gospel. But even if we don't persuade them with the gospel, we are still going to be blessed and strengthened by the effort. The Spirit of God will be present with us to bless us. So it all again boils down to all the different aspects of worship. That's how we are equipped. That's how we're sanctified. That's how we're built up in Christ. That's how we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to make the best use of every opportunity we have to worship the Lord. That's putting on the armor of God. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us. And let's not forget that the Lord's table is another way to do that. So let's ask Him at the same time to prepare us to come to that table.